but do uh, those of you who don't know Kinesh, he's a consultant gastroenterologist at Chelsea and Westminster in London. And he's going to start the ball rolling with an introduction to this concept. And over to you, Kinesh. Great. Thank you very much, Anthony. And thank you for asking me to present tonight. Um, I am going to talk um, a little bit about uh, this whole treatment area. And um, I think the first thing to say is that this is a challenging area and that always causes a bit of consternation and angst in the people seeing these patients. I'm going to talk a bit about the treatment options at the moment, and I'm going to hand over to Anthony, who's going to give us the bombastic bit about the novel diagnostics and treatment approaches um, and what we should be doing or what we should think about, should be considering doing in, in the future. And then Marcus is going to end with the $64,000 question um, that we're always asked is, is surgery the right way to go for these patients? And um, that should hopefully give us a bit of light about that because it's something that comes up again and again and again. Um, okay. So, um, as I said, this is often how people feel. It's how GPs feel, it's how I often feel, and I'm sure it's how ENT surgeons feel as well when faced with these patients who have troublesome symptoms. And hopefully during this talk, we'll get a little feel of why that is and why we all, the patients and the physicians, will feel frustrated in this arena. So what are throat symptoms? So these are the common things that people present with. It's pain, globus, pain when they're swallowing, recurrent coughing, throat clearing, difficulty swallowing or changes in the voice. And they're all slightly different, but the patients always localize them to the throat. And they sometimes ascribe uh, you know, their symptoms to reflux. Are they right? Are they wrong? Who knows? But, but people complain about these things. They're often very debilitating for the patients. They cause a huge amount of anxiety and people suffer them day on, day in, day out, and they don't know what to do. And they seek medical attention. And that's probably one of the reasons they become quite so frustrated. So in general practice surveys, if the GP asks people about throat symptoms, a quarter will say they've got throat symptoms. So these things are incredibly common. Uh, you know, I don't think there are many conditions where you get 25% uptake um, in the general population of people attending general practitioners for you know, their athlete's foot or anything else. And 6% of middle-aged women have globus. So these are big numbers when you translate these to a population level. And this, these throat symptoms have been made analogous into LPR. And I'm not an ENT surgeon, but it's something that um, I work closely with ENT surgeons um, all the time. And this is one of the dilemmas because throat symptoms don't necessarily equate to LPR. And this is one of the reasons that patients get frustrated because they're not actually sure what's going on. So LPR is when you get reflux from the stomach up into the larynx and you know what why is that why does that cause a problem well reflux itself uh, is when gastric contents move at ab uh, an high level into the esophagus um, and we know that people with LPR have higher levels of reflux about 40 percent of them on a background of 20 percent of the general population so reflux is more common but uh, what we do in the esophagus, or the, what, the, what the esophagus does, is it's stratified uh, epithelium. It's much more able to deal with this acidity coming up. The larynx is not the esophagus. Um, of course, that's true, but, but the epithelium is completely different. It's the columnar epithelium. It's much more sensitive. And there are some studies showing one bout of reflux or gastric contents or bile or pepsin or anything moving up in there can cause damage to the larynx. So we know that that part of our body is exquisitely sensitive. And is it that that is the problem here? And is it that uh, that recurrent damage is what's causing the problem and throat symptoms and the persistent clearing and everything else that's causing so much anxiety and difficulty? Um, and we know things like bile, if it's there, cause high level, high pH reflux eight. Um, and it's got enzymes and agents that really uh, tackle that very exquisitely sensitive laryngeal epithelium. And you can imagine the larynx is highly innovated. And if there's anything wrong there at all, you know, we would expect that we would feel it 
all the time. And, and that's what these people complain of. So what could it be? So this is a differential diagnosis. Is it postnasal drip? Is it something in the nose? Is it that they've got a behavioral problem, throat clearing, are they smoking? Are they talking too much to their verbal diarrhea? Um, you know, is it, is it an environmental problem? You know, is it stress? You know, we have to be upfront about that, that stress certainly can manifest itself just as it can do in the joints or the muscles or um, the stomach or with diarrhea. It can also manifest itself in the throat. And that is one of the differentials and one that's particularly difficult to address. Um, or is there something go going on and is the, is the larynx being sensitized and, and that's causing the problem? And once we consider all of these things, everyone feels like this all over again. We feel like this in the patient things like, what do we actually do? Uh, and that's, therein lies the challenge. So on a practical level, now, the patients that we see in secondary care are not the ones out there with the majority of the problem, just like everything else. And we have often this ivory tower view of things, whereas most of this is managed by general practitioners. So most patients are diagnosed there by their GP based on their symptoms alone. And those symptoms are different. If they have dysphagia, of course, they need to come and see a gastroenterologist and have an endoscopy and all those sorts of things. If they've got pure throat symptoms without anything that makes you think, well, this might be cancer, then the GP will often initiate some sort of treatment themselves. If they see an ENT surgeon, um, they will uh, do a flexible laryngoscopy, um, mesendoscopy, and if they see us, well, we will scope them, but we all love scoping. But, you know, if I'm completely honest, I'm not sure that that has a huge yield and whether it actually moves the patient further forward in terms of their diagnosis and improving their symptoms is unclear and unproven. We may do a pH catheter study to look for reflux, you know, is there reflux coming up? Is that a useful test one? Um, or if the patient can't tolerate it and or they don't want it and, and lots of people feel like they don't want a pH catheter study because um, of the fear of discomfort, then a wireless pH study, is, is that helpful? Again, you know, that's a good test for reflux, but is reflux the driver of these symptoms or is something else going on? Um, and so pragmatically, what has been done for many, many years is give them some PPI. Could it be reflux? Reflux is a bit more common in people with throat symptoms. So let's give them some PPIs and um, let's see how they get along with that and let's push the problem down the road. So as I said to you um, before, um, gastroesophageal reflux and LPR, they often coexist at 40% and, and, you know, we can get 50 reflux events in the esophagus and that's, that's normal, but, you know, people are showing one, two, three, four reflux events up in the, um, into the larynx can cause, can be pathological and can cause inflammation and symptoms. And there's this debate about whether um, acid is needed, but we know that, you know, you don't necessarily need acid if you have bile coming up into the throat and we all, uh, you know, we know from, uh, you know, if you see someone with a biliary stoma, bile is one of the most caustic substances that we have. It's up there with feces. You know, you get feces on your skin, it'll burn. If you get bile on your skin, it'll burn. There's, you know, you can imagine that if you're getting bile in places where it shouldn't be, like the throat, then it is going to burn there too. There's no reason why it would be any different, particularly in an area of the body that is so exquisitely sensitive. So why is this done? So there have been lots of um, studies along the way, and this is one, an old one from 2007, and they took 49 patients uh, and with throat symptoms, and they did a pH catheter study on all of them, and uh, they found that 27 of those had uh, abnormal levels of reflux in the upper esophagus, so they gave them some isometrazole and they did it again. And it worked in 22 out of 27, which is a, you know, Good marker of how good esimeprazole is at decreasing, decreasing acidity. But out of the other five that didn't have decreased acidity, four of them felt better. There's something else is going on here. It's clearly not just an acid problem. And given it's not an acid problem, you know, people have thought, uh, you know, done small studies, uncontrolled studies along the way saying, oh, well, PPIs seem to work. I've taken my 12 patients and, you know, eight of them felt better. So PPIs are a good thing. And so this group published this 
large multicenter study, a pragmatic real world study, which I think is, you know, the way to go. And increasingly, um, certainly journals like the BMJ want to see real world data rather than ones from uh, tertiary centers. And they looked at PPIs to see could they help treat persistent throat symptoms. And it was eight centers, 350 patients, and they had unexplained throat symptoms. So hoarseness, throat pain, globus, clearing, cough, and or choking. And these are all common symptoms um, and they're evaluated. Uh, and they had a reflux symptom index, which I'll talk about on the next slide, and um, they had flexible nasal endoscopy as well. And this is the reflux symptom index, and people rate it themselves zero to five, depending on how bad the problem is with those um, you know, issues, hoarseness, clearing your throat, swallowing, coughing, breathing, and all the things that people um, find difficult um, when they're dealing with this. And uh, you can see that you, know, you can, there's nine items, five each, so that comes out of 45. And what they did was they analyzed this one of two ways, because you could get as, you know, you can get five marks just for having simple chest pain without any throat symptoms. So they, they took two markers. One was just this out of 45, and one of them, they just eliminated the bottom one. So that was just what they called the RSI HB, which will be important later. And, and the HB indicates nothing to do with heartburn in it. Um, and they looked at those outcome measures saying, did PPIs help? And if they were on a PPI, they had a four week washout, and then they were given a high dose of lanzoprazole, um, 30 milligrams twice daily for 16 weeks with a matching placebo. Because you know, in this setting, there's been no studies looking at one PPI uh, being better than another. And 27% of pe people have received PPIs in the last 12 months, and that's relevant because again, it's a practical real world study, and we know that PPIs are commonly used in general practice deal with a multitude of symptoms. Um, and at the end, this is always interesting and something often not mentioned in papers, but really gives you a good clue about how good the drug are is. So only 42% of people on PPI worked out, guessed that they're on PPI, and 56% guessed in the placebo group. So no one really knew what they were taking as, you know, and there's not, uh, and that gives you some idea about what the results are going to show. So these are the scores and they've looked at the reflux symptom index. As I mentioned, they've looked at uh, when they've taken away the heartburn score, they've looked at other reflux scores and a, and a quality of life score. And essentially with all these scores, what you need to essentially be aware that the higher the number, the worse the symptoms are. And you can see if we look at the top uh, red box, that actually at 16 weeks, both groups have improved um, significantly from 22 to 17, or 0.4 and 15.6 and then at 12 months both groups have improved again and that goes for every single one of these measures so essentially everyone got better on ppi or placebo treatment and their very practical conclusion was that lansoprasol really didn't help over placebo for patients with persistent throat symptoms in a true randomized controlled trial the and the downside of this was there was no reflux testing. So, you know, we don't know if having reflux changes whether lansoprazole or PPI would be helpful. But in a pragmatic GP type way, actually giving people PPIs for throat symptoms is probably unhelpful. Um, and that led the NIHR to issue this um, alert saying don't give out PPIs uh, willy-nilly to GPs. And, so, what next? Because that's really um, to put the kibosh on what people have done. It's, it's easy to write a prescription. It's easy to send the patient away saying, try this for you know, at least three months, maybe six months, and come back and see me again. And what next is what I call the acetic plan. And that is very different to the acetic plan, which means drinking plenty until you've got ascites. No, this is the acetic plan, living like a monk. Okay. And if we have a look at LPR diet on Google, you can see there's 106,000 results for that. So people are interested in this and people are interested in, in diet and lifestyle changes. So stop smoking, less caffeine, no peppermint, even no decaffeinated tea or coffee, no acidic or spicy foods, dropping the pH in the larynx if pepsin can be activated. Um, 
smaller meals, don't exercise for two hours after eating, don't eat or drink for three hours before sleeping, lose some weight. And all this is good lifestyle advice, but the quality of evidence for all of this is very, very poor. It's observational. No one's looked at this in a methodical, systematic way, but we do it because we think it might make a difference. But, you know, we're pretty sure it probably doesn't make very much difference and people essentially don't want to follow this. So they say that they're better. Um, so we're back to this differential diagnosis. You know, which one of these is it? Is it something else? Uh, should we be doing something else? And what do I do in my practice? I and mean, I often think about things backwards. You know, what, and I think at this stage, often we think, what are the reasonable medical options? What treatments do we have available that could be useful? And because that's all we have, we either do nothing or we give them some medicine or we do some sort of procedure. And to my mind, the treatment options here are, it's either baclofen, which reduces transient lyrosophageal sphincter relaxation, but it's complicated by sedation. Neuromodulators, for which there's a little bit of low level, low quality evidence, tricyclics, gabapentin or pregabalin, all of these have been published. I mean, I often use nortriptyline for a minimum of three months to, because that addresses many of the differentials of hypersensitivity and, and you know, assess does that make a difference? And, and that can help people and making sure you've got the right dose and uh, titrating it upwards is probably helpful too. But I think that for me is often my next step, but it is a gray area and there certainly is no high quality uh, data behind that assertion. And then they come back. So what next? Do we do speech therapy? Do we do some more testing? Do we send them off to psychologists for CBT? Or oh, that's all done online now. Or do we have an operation? And the answer to that is we don't know. And that's why I'm going to hand over to Anthony now to hopefully shed some light on some of these conundrums. Thanks very much, Kinesh. Um, so we don't have any open questions. If anybody wants to um, ask a question directly, they could turn on their video, raise their hand, uh, and we can do that. Um, otherwise, I will ask a couple of questions myself and then we'll move on. So Kinesh, in terms of using neuromodulators, um, you know, one of the things for using neuromodulators in IBS is that about 30% you know, or more of patients can't tolerate the side effect profile. Um, do you find the same in, in these LPR patients? Yeah, absolutely. I and mean, that's why, I mean, Amitriptyline used to be the rage, but actually I find the majority of people couldn't tolerate amitriptyline due to sedation. Nortriptyline is better tolerated. There's certainly less sedation with it, but even then people have issues with you know, palpitations and sometimes sedation as well and feeling of depersonalization. But I'd say the majority of people can tolerate it. But again, you know, with all these things, there is a placebo effect and no one's looked at this in a systematic, rigorous and controlled way. So, but we aren't left with many medical options. And what do we do when we're not left with medical options? We use things with low quality evidence and that's what we're doing. So we've got a question here from an attendee um, asking any role for Gaviscon Advanced. So yeah, so the, I think Gaviscon is probably the thing with the, the best, uh, you know, uh, well, I'm not gonna say evidence-based, but the best hypothetical evidence in that you know, we know the PPI, what have people done in the past is use PPIs and then add in ranitidine or some simetidine or something else like that, which we know now is, is pretty hopeless, both partly because H2 blockers are affected by tachyphylaxis. So, you know, they, they affect wanes after three or four weeks um, anyway. Um, and there's again, another placebo effect there. With Gaviscon, there is a barrier function that's forming that raft and actually coating the larynx if there is damage caused by reflux from the stomach and if that is the diagnosis is likely more helpful than any of the other strategies and also I mean, there are no side effects with Gaviscon so uh, it is probably the best bet here. Um, I've got another question but just before I move on to that the, there is a product called Zivarel that we were looking at that um, is I think it's uh, marketed by Norgene and it's hyaluronic acid in, in sachets um, 
which seems to have some use in, in European studies, but not much in the UK. We did ask if they were interested in doing this study and, and they weren't, strangely. But uh, that's another thing that we tried um, empirically with patients uh, as a kind of coating for both the, the um, larynx and pharynx and, and proximal esophagus. So the only problem with it is it has quite a lot of artificial sugar in it. So it has a quite high xylitol content. And from my talk later, that might have its own problems. So this question is from uh, Mahmoud Wahed. He said, uh, "Would you in, who should investigate and manage LPR, ENTs or gastros? So I think a little bit depends on who they present to. I think with the NHS, the way it is, sending someone to another specialty, at least when we know that the initial management of this is fairly straightforward. Uh, so it should be the person that sees the patient. It can be the GP, it can be ENT, it can be gastroenterology. I think if they're coming up from... Uh, GP from the GPs then they should probably go directly to ENT but they're in front of us then I think as gastroenterologists then I think we take we take the lead and only if symptoms are refractory they go off to ENT. Great so um, this is a comment from Craig Vickery are you happy to give this group a diagnosis for LPR at this point I think what he means by that is um, do we say they're LPR like symptoms or I mean we'll probably inter interact um, interject mm -hmm. Um, during this study, because we specifically talked about throat symptoms rather than LPR with the title of this, but at what point would you consider giving someone a, a diagnosis of LPR? I think LPRs, you know, they have to have someone look down and say the, there is evidence of damage here. And there's a scoring system for ENT surgeons that they'll be able to talk about more than me. But, uh, you know, I think if you're on a pragmatic level, not everyone who has all these symptoms can see an ENT surgeon. There isn't that capacity in the NHS, so there has to be a more pragmatic way of trying to deal with this and filter out the ones that need to see an ENT surgeon. So another question from me, um, <clears throat> you know, when PPIs first came on the scene you know, 30 years ago, we, we were doing um, uh, some of the early studies um, and, you know, the concern for us all at that point was that these were going to become lifestyle drugs and people wouldn't you know lose weight and, and do all these different things they would just take their ppis and carry on as normal um <clears throat> and of course it's been very convenient because they're so effective in drugs um you know do you think it's going to be hard for people to break the habit if they see a patient with throat symptoms to still go down this road even though the guidance is uh, fairly clear Sorry, I'm not sure. I didn't catch that. Sorry. So I'm just saying, do you think it's going to be hard for people to break the habit after so many years of prescribing? Yes. PPIs? Yeah. I mean, I think that is uh, that. There's no doubt about that. That, and also, it's it's an easy option, isn't it, to give a prescription for a drug? So you take this medicine. We hope you'll feel better. I'll see you in six months. Uh, that is much easier than dealing with all the other issues. And I think this is uh, mirrored by Rami. Spice's comment here saying despite this study suggesting there's no difference in response there's still people who do respond to to PPI and should we not give those an opportunity to respond if they're going to well so I think that that's what I said actually so uh yeah everyone responds so instead of giving them PPI you should give them a placebo because we know that they respond at the same level that's what the study shows and I mean, all the previous studies have been low quality probably hampered by selection bias and everything else so yes, they do respond to a PPI, but they also respond to placebo. So we have to have a mechanism of dealing with that. That doesn't involve dishing out active drugs to people who will, will respond if we don't give them an active drug. Okay, um, just checking if there's any more questions. Okay, so I think we're okay. So I'm gonna, um, hand over control of monitoring the questions and comments to uh, Kinesh. And I think there's one more question that's just come in. Is there any role, this is from Dan Cartledge, any role for prokinetics? No role for prokinetics at all. I mean, the issue with prokinetics as well is that most of them have significant issues with toxicity if used long-term, domperidone, azithromycin, metoclopramide, which is a black box warning in the US. So, you know, we try to minimise use of these anyway, and if you've got a long-term problem, these don't work anyway, but even with people who do benefit from prokinetic, we try to minimise their use. So, so no on every level to that. 
And you know, one final one for me in terms of the physiology, which is obviously closest to my heart. Um, most of those studies didn't use physiology to, um, you know, correlate with with response to to drug. Is that the biggest weak point of most of these studies that you're not actually identifying those people who have got reflux before you try and treat them for it? So I think that's right. Although the first study I did, they did identify people with reflux, and they showed that those, you know, who didn't have a response to reflux um, treatment still got better. So there's something else here. Okay. So I'm going to close that down and then I'm going to share my screen.